Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. The forests of Kai Shell, continent of the South Pole, are haunted by many strange entities. Silent herds of colossal reptiles, floating clouds of bioluminescent magic, countless lineages of enchanted beasts and shrouded demons. Chief among these strange wonders are the apex predators of Kai Shell. These are the architects of silence, the silent ones. Their presence has shaped the continent, and all in their domain are oppressed into quiet. Birds flash bright colors rather than sing. Herds of dinosaurs have ornate headgear to keep an eye on one another rather than call out. Even the humans have minimal vocalizations in their language, instead relying on facial expression and hand signs. The origins of the Silent Ones is part of the mystery. Are they demons? Enchanted creations of the first children? Perhaps even organisms from another planet? Although many theories have been put forward about them, trying to separate fact from fiction, recent studies of a few captured specimens, along with related animals, has revealed a great deal. The Silent Ones, along with such animals as the Jetsukan of Pacardia, belong to a newly recognized clade of tetrapods that can trace their chimeran origins to some time in the first harvests in the late Devonian and early Carboniferous. These ancient tetrapods, called Wachirids, were harvested before amniotes and amphibians split from their common ancestor, meaning this group of Chimere represents an entire lineage of highly derived tetrapods unique to the planet. During this time, newly arrived terrestrial plants were presented with over half a billion square miles of free real estate. The planet very quickly became a vast hothouse jungle. Humidity and oxygen increased to unprecedented degrees. Much like what happened on Earth, this verdant terrestrial planet-wide habitat drew vast quantities and diversity of aquatic and amphibious life onto the land. Although for a time there was plenty to go around, this bounty of course eventually got filled to capacity as nature is wont to do, and soon competition spiked. The portal itself had plenty of floor on which to sustain itself, so had no reason to harvest from Earth. This first dynasty of as Chimera and paleontologists call it, was dominated by an astonishing diversity of clades, many of which had undertaken such dramatic adaptive radiations that they have no close counterparts on Earth. One of these clades was the heterotherms. Most of the dominant clades were reliant upon heat and humidity for all aspects of life, which of course spurred them to dominate this worldwide swamp. The heterotherms were a group of small arboreal generalists. Several could glide, and at least two clades evolved powered flight. This group gets their name from the metabolism that can shift dramatically from an inefficient yet energetic endothermy to a sluggish torpor depending on food availability. While present in the tropics, they did best in the temperate regions down toward the poles. Given how ubiquitous the trait is in modern heterotherms, it seems that quite early on in their evolution, the clade was coated in a non-Newtonian slime. Non-Newtonian fluids are liquids that have varying levels of viscosity, in this case becoming solid whenever kinetic energy is applied. The harder its impact, the stronger the slime hardens in that brief moment. This would have helped them survive falling, a useful trait when living in the trees, but of course offered a degree of protection from predators as well. Salt distilled this slime somewhat, so they generally avoided coastal regions and salt lakes. As Earth's climate shifted and the humid, abundant Carboniferous shifted to the more arid Permian, Chimere persisted in a more stable, humid climate. When the portal made an occasional harvest, for the most part, 
humid adapted fauna of the first dynasty continued their dominance. It was not until Chimera's tropical continents converged and prompted its own period of aridity at around the beginning of Earth's late Permian that the forests and swamps began to recede. Many clades from the first dynasty went extinct, and the incoming fauna had a clear advantage some 40 million years of adapting to an arid, cooler world. Synapses quickly overtook many of the niches. Even the tropical heterotherms, which were masters of survival, struggled in the face of animals better suited to this context. It seems only the two flying clades lasted particularly long into the Permian dynasty. A southern continent comprised of today what is known as Kaishel, Arvel, and Picardia, there were no terrestrial connections to the portal, and therefore the indigenous fauna was able to adapt at a much more reliable pace rather than being swiftly outcompeted by fauna better suited to an arid climate. It was here that the heterotherms thrived. The top predator were the bulky beasts who had changed little from their modern heterotherms such as Jetsuka. The primary method of prey capture in these heterotherms is spitting an adhesive slime. In addition to sticking like glue, this slime has the same non-Newtonian properties as that on their skin, meaning that prey can only move away slowly. With any movement, the glue becomes hard as force applied allows. This made them excellent at catching the dominant herbivores of the time, Fabodonts, another clade of tetrapods often compared to herbivorous crocodiles and named for their bean-shaped teeth, though again they long predated the divergence of even amphibians from stem tetrapods, so are very much unique to Chimere. During the early years of the late Cretaceous, a land bridge formed between the southern and tropical continents. While a bridge between Kaishel and eastern Kairul seemed most likely, it has also been suggested that Arvel's rotation may have linked Nikar and Kaishel, though this theory is not as well accepted. Whatever the origin, this biotic interchange largely favored temperate fauna entering Kaishel and Arvel, though the eastern half of Kairul is so poorly studied that naturalists speculate there may be some discovered there. While this invasion of mammals and dinosaurs pushed the Fabodonts to the brink of extinction, heterotherms persisted as mesopredators under the rule of giant theropods. It is not known if they were Silurosaurs, Carcharodontosaurs, or Megalosaurs, but whatever they were, they were the top predator of Kaishel for many millions of years. The continent underwent an extinction event around 40 million years ago. This is when Arvel and Picardia cut ties with Kaishel, and the closing of several current gyres coupled with rising mountains resulted in more scattered habitats, and it seems many of the large dinosaurs went extinct. Multiduberculate mammals and small dinosaurs arose to occupy various niches, yet the apex predators came from the heterotherms. A lineage of blind heterotherms, once gliders but now arboreal but hunted by echolocation, was given the name Xenosimians by the assembly. These nocturnal hunters were present in many basic aspects all the way back to the first dynasty. In an evolutionary blink of an eye, an adaptive radiation saw a few genera become an entire order of arboreal and cursorial predators. From this stock, the genus Xenospiritus overtook their large cousins and spread throughout the continent. Coast Brazil safe, as this clade of heterotherms is especially wary of salt, and therefore became a haven to any animal which made any noise. Within the continental interior, however, the dominion of Xenospiritus hemacementum is absolute. The Tlatan, native peoples of Kaishel, do not have a spoken language of their own. In their silent language of hand signs, they call these creatures many things. Makers of silence, through death they make quiet, and kiss of lead blood. Their neighboring Chimerans, the Tokatan, call them Morkutlot, architects of silence. In the known world, Silent Ones is a typical translation of these alleged demons of cold and quiet, though many naturalists consider it misleading. 
The moor kuklot is not a particularly quiet animal. Their echolocation is often compared to the crackling of fire, and they make all sorts of grunts, snorts, and hissing vocalizations. They are social animals, and without eyes, they interact with the world through sound. They aren't silent, but their presence and predation has meant that Keishel is a quiet world. More could lot stand between 5 and 6 feet at the shoulder. Despite arboreal ancestors, they are cursorial animals able to gallop at up to 40 miles per hour. Digits 2 and 3 are hooved, supporting their weight on the ground, though their first, fourth, and fifth digits retain hooked claws. Though they appear to be quite formidable weapons, these claws are rarely employed in combat, and primarily used to help them climb into a sturdy tree when they anticipate a prolonged stasis. Although their sense of smell is passable and they are blind to the point that their eyes are vestigial covered in skin, touch and hearing are honed to an extreme degree. Each hoof has a fatty pad which is packed with nerves, allowing them to feel a meter down with each step, and further while running, useful when racing through dense forests. Like dolphins, a mass of waxy fluid fills out the front of their snout. This amplifies their clicks. Normally, keratinized ears are folded over this organ for protection. However, the ear shields can open, along with a strut on either side, forming a massive disc. With this, they have not only a wider range, but it can more precisely detect the locations of potential prey. They won't open their ears during a chase, as the conventional clicks give them a clear enough picture as they close in, but when they need more range or lose a target, they will stand tall and let the lower frequency sounds paired with their open disc. Normally, they can hear and detect shapes hundreds of meters off, but with their ears open, they can detect even quiet footfalls over a mile away. Like other heterotherms of their clade, the Morkutlot possesses slime that makes their skin very difficult to damage on quick impacts. Tlatan and Chimeran explorers have a plethora of accounts describing weapons glancing off their hide. Even the assembly's few encounters with these organisms proved low-caliber bullets deflected with ease. Long rifles proved the slime's increasing strength being proportional to the force applied eventually has its limits, though even these were greatly reduced in efficacy. A similar substance is concentrated as a venom, which they inject through their long, barbed tongue, which can extend over twice the length of the animal and is supported by a hyoid apparatus which wraps up around the arms and into a humped shoulder. The tip of this tongue forms a pocket. Not only does this tongue impact with sufficient force to break bone, this kiss of lead blood injects non-Newtonian venom into the bloodstream. While their cousins coat a venom in slime, Morkithlot venom has the same properties, but at much more potent concentration. Each heartbeat makes the blood solidify for a moment, and any motion while the venom is in the body can have catastrophic consequences. As detailed in Haunted Legacy, victims the size of a person can die in a few agonizing seconds, with each motion locking and rupturing vessels and muscles, and the moment it reaches the heart, only a few cycles of the heart solidifying after a beat is all it takes to kill. The metabolism of Morkutlot represent an extreme within the clade. When there is no food and no sound guiding them toward prey, they become extremely sluggish. They will retreat to a tree or some other secluded area before their reserves run out and enter a stasis. This condition sees near-complete shutdown of their bodies, their heart doesn't beat, and they can go months without breathing. They can live for centuries, though, as adults, a majority of this time is spent in stasis, so such a statement on their lifespan is misleading. It takes significant noise to awaken a morkotlot from stasis, but their most confident source to wake up is the lilting cry of another silent one. They charge toward this dinner bell even miles away. 
At this pace, their metabolism is on fumes from whatever their previous meal was, and they will gorge themselves on whatever prey is spotted along with any of their kin slain in the attempt. If they burn through their reserves before arrival, or the prey manages to fend them off long enough, they sometimes perish from overexertion. Fortunately for the Morkid lot, even prey weighing several tons will eventually succumb as long as they inject enough venom, and once they do, there will be a great feast. Their jaws have been compared to sharks like the great white and tiger, and for good reason. Their bite is astonishingly powerful, their teeth readily shed and are continuously sharp and serrated, and their jaws strike a surprising balance of flexibility and power. When hunting small prey, they simply use their tongue for capture and swallow, but against large game, these flexible and slicing jaws are perfect for rapid bulk feeding. When utilizing the same resources, slow metabolism or ectothermic predators like a crocodile can support a much higher population of slower going but much larger predators than one with a fast metabolism like a lion but endothermic predators often dominate because they have more energy. Unfortunately, endothermic predators need a lot of prey, so they often struggle in harsh environs. As a heterotherm, and an extreme representative of this metabolism, the Morkert lot make the best of both worlds. They grow fast and have lots of energy when the resources allow, but can endure tough conditions with the best of them, sometimes going years without a meal. While they have complex brains, their intelligence is almost entirely devoted to motion, balance, and auditory processing. Everything about them is specialized for efficiency. This extends to their reproduction. When capacity allows, they can have many offspring, often mating and laying dozens of slime-encased eggs when a large kill is made, but they only feed and grow when resources allow, and starvation only leads to pause, not death. It is this quality, not their serrated teeth or non-Newtonian venom, which has led to their overwhelming dominance over the continent. Other predators are stronger, faster, larger, or better armed, but the Morkutlot can rapidly fill their niche to capacity, and if there's not enough to go around, it's no bother to wait until the situation shifts back in their favor. For all these formidable traits, the Morkutlot is not without weakness. Salt. Like all heterotherms, their slime deteriorates when contacted with salt. Their own bodies are of course comprised of some salt, so it takes a decent amount to cause a negative reaction. Salt does not harm them directly, but as it deteriorates their slime, it is quite uncomfortable and bad for their skin. The Morkertlot avoids coastal habitats. Because of their absence, in these habitats, which are most abundant, and only desperate beasts dare venture into the woods. The Tlatan, who live inland, do so with salt-encrusted armor and weaponry, allowing them to deter the venomous strikes and penetrations of their slime, allowing a few brave heroes to vanquish these monsters. Little is known of the first children invasion of Kai Shell, but if accounts from the Tlatan are to be believed, these beings came to Kaishel and captured many of their people. They also ventured onto the mainland. According to myth, it was the Morkudlot who repelled these invaders. Even so, the first children took several specimens, as Morkudlot are an important component of Class III homunculi, those created in the third and final stage of the first children's domain. Their slime and homunculi skin, paired with crystalline epidermis, means homunculi of this class are notoriously difficult to injure, and some also possess a similar venom. Although it is by far the most famous and abundant member of the order, and the only living member of its genus, the Morkritlot has many living relatives. Most, like the frog sloths and frog apes live in the canopy and hunt quietly so as not to draw the attention of their notorious cousins. Morkudlot may not be arboreal, but as mentioned earlier, they are surprisingly capable climbers from a recent climbing ancestor, and their presence enforces silence even in the higher branches. The snaphounds of the genus Xenocanus have several species, 
with the largest being a social predator, Xenocanus dronius. This genus is more derived than the Morchid lot, with reduced toes and greater intelligence. While very much in the shadow of their larger cousins, assembly naturalists suspect that this more intelligent and social predator stands a good chance of inheriting the niche should anything happen to the silent ones. As the genus Xenospiritus has survived largely unchanged since taking over from a relative after the dynastic extinction, it is assumed that significant contextual change will have to occur to give Xenocanus this opportunity. But if the opportunity comes, these small and more intelligent predators are poised for a takeover. For centuries, the Jetsukan was assumed to be a long-surviving Lazarus taxon of a long-extinct First Dynasty lineage. Their order is called Pechuetuvera, as there are as many as a dozen species in their branch of heterotherms and Kaishel, and rumors of some in the hinterlands of both Kairul and Arvel, this more basal order has proven to be quite widespread, diverse, and surprisingly successful. In fact, the interior Kaishel around the poles is a vast desert dotted with glaciers. As it was once part of Whalehaven Bay, much of it is a salt flat and therefore inhospitable to the Silent Ones. It is here that a large pituit varan, Arctobufo, is the top predator and largest known heterotherm. Their slime is under a layer of tough skin, giving them impact benefits without deteriorating from both the salt flats below and from saline onshore winds. They do not spit slime, although their bite has the same venom. They can kill with brute force, but often prefer to bite and retreat letting their prey to succumb to toxins, shock, and blood loss. Most of their prey are migrating fauna heading to the seasonally abundant Gulf Coast forests, then back to warmer continental shores further north during winter. Arctobufo often only makes two or three kills a year, one on their way to the Gulf Coast and once on the way back, and much of their lives are spent in stasis. This lifestyle of bulk feeding twice a year and enduring the rest is a gift of their strange metabolism. While all pituit varans have a degree of color change capacities, the chromatophore dense skin of Arctobufo and its family are especially adaptable. Normally they spend their days in a dull gray or white depending on the environment, but when hunting or displaying they often show radiant displays of pulsating patterns. Especially when confronting prey like dinosaurs that have keen vision, this can be disorienting and even stunning long enough that they can land a killing bite. When choosing a mate, which often takes place in the few times of the year where there is abundant food, males will try to make their opponents surrender to nausea with neon flashes, while females find attractive from indirect angles at a safer distance. They have also been observed to mimic colors in their environment out of boredom. The Tlatans say they are made of stone which fell from the tips of aurora lights, which is why in the Winter Lights Dance, any Arctobufo not in stasis seem mesmerized, staring up at the lights from whence they came with the same hues of dark sky and green or violent stripes dancing along their bodies. Although the beaches, coastal forests, and fern prairies of Kaishel are crowded and boisterous, packed with many strange yet fundamentally familiar beasts, the interior of Kaishel is defined by silence from the dominion of the first creatures to call Kaimir home. Some newly arrived fauna like caribou are thriving, since there aren't many beasts and large noisy herds, so there is very little competition. But like other newcomers who think they struck ecological gold, it is assumed that eventually the Loud Ones will all be hunted down, and Caribou will follow all other beasts of Kaishel in a terrifying quiet enforced by the Morkutlot, tyrant spirits of the Silent Forest. Cheers to Ian for sponsoring this episode. As some of you may have guessed, the Silent Ones were inspired by the future predators of Prime Evil. When I first saw the show back in high school, these formidable speculative hunters from a bleak future were fascinating to me. 
When I first made their analogs in Chimera over a decade ago, they were homunculi, monstrous fusions of man and bat. Over time, I found it to be more compelling to make theirs a natural origin, something that would seem very alien, yet in truth are among the most ancient residents of Chimera, and so, maybe unfamiliar to us, hardly alien in a world they were among the first to call home. Similar blind and audio-focused hunters, presumably also inspired by either the future predator or its predecessor, Dougal Dixon's Night Stalker, have become an exciting trope in science fiction, such as A Quiet Place and The Silence. I debuted the Morkut lot in my second anthology, Songs of the Inland Sea. Won't spoil anything, but man was it fun to have in their introduction. They will also play a fun role in the third anthology, Whispers from Beyond the Known World, but more on that later. Thanks again to Ian, to my Patreon patrons for your continued support, and thank you so much for watching. Stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks!